man who was in charge of the entire disciplinary actions taken against the whole Roman legion that was there in Jerusalem. He was kind of like the sergeant of arms. Big old muscled guy who'd flogged just hundreds of legionnaires before. And he came out there and he was far from his home. He wanted to go back to Italy. He was tired. He was tired of foreign wars. He was tired of being in a place he didn't like, a bunch of people he didn't understand with customs that were weird. And this was a chance for him to take out some of his animosity and frustration against the leader of these Jews. So he walked up to this task with real relish, you know. And he took out this big old whip and he shook it out. And he looked at Jesus and he measured his distance from Jesus to him. And he took this scourge and he took his big muscled arm and he brought it up. And he brought that whip whistling down on Jesus' back. And the tongues of that scourge, they wrapped themselves around Jesus' body. And they stuck into him and the pieces of metal clawed at him. The length of each one of the thongs had been coated with sheep's blood. And bits of pottery, had broken pottery and stuff, had been kind of glued to each one. So each strand just stuck onto Jesus and clawed into his flesh. And the tips of the, of the, of the scourge ends, the lead tips, would cut into him and gouge him. And when a man had a good bite on Jesus, he would twist the whip and pull so that great big chunks of meat were ripped off of Jesus' body and he was cut open. And Jesus took 39 stripes like that. 39 times that man's arm came up and fell. 39 times that whip bit into Jesus. At the middle of the scourging, the man had to change and whip Jesus on the other side because one side of his body had already been reduced to raw hamburger meat and there just wasn't enough sound flesh left to beat. The historian of the day says that Jesus Christ was reduced to human rubble. It says, the, the histories of the day say that there was not one inch on Jesus' body that wasn't cut or bruised, or bleeding, or, or gashed open, or something. Then they cut him down, and the executioner gave the rest of the legionnaires a chance to take out some of their frustrations. Someone had called him the king of the Jews, so one of the Roman legionnaires went and got a, a purple robe. And they flung it over Jesus' battered body. And it was on there, and they got, a, they got a crown made out of thorns. And the thorns were about like this, about, oh, about five to six inches long. And they were hard as nails, old Judean thorns. And they braided a crown for him, and they stuck it up on his head, and they beat it down around his ears with rods until it was just stuck into his scalp and stuck into his head and gouging into his face. And they put a scepter in his hand, and they mocked him. And they spit on him. And they pulled out his beard in fistfuls. And they called him a king. And laughed at him. And the Bible says they smote him in the face. And the Greek word there that they use for the word to smite is the same Greek word that they use for striking a man with a closed fist. It's the word or the root word for the word pugilism, which means boxing. And it was striking Jesus in the face with a fist. They punched Jesus out. The whole company did. When they got done with that, they drug him back in and gave him back to the Roman procurator named Pilate. And Pilate brought him out to the crowd. This was the same crowd that a week before had hailed him as Messiah. It said that they'd love him, that they would follow him, that they'd stick by him. Pilate brought him out to the crowd and stood him before the crowd. And next to him stood a condemned murderer named Barabbas. And Pilate says, it's Passover time. I'll give you either one of these men you want. I'll give you this murderer, Barabbas, or I'll give you this man here in whom I can find no fault. I'll give you Jesus, who is supposed to be your king. Now, which do you want? And on top of the scourging, on top of the humiliation, on top of the pain and the loss of blood, Jesus had to stand there and watch the people he loved turn his, their back on him and scream for the release of Barabbas. He had to stand there and watch while he was deserted by everybody he cared for. And he had to stand there and listen to the shouts of, Give us Barabbas. We want Barabbas. Crucify Jesus. 
crucify him. We want Barabbas. Then they took him out and they ripped that purple robe off his back after they had a chance to congeal with the blood. And it ripped every one of Jesus' wounds open again and he began to bleed all over again. And they put his own robe on his back. They settled a 200 pound cross on his back and made him walk up the Via Della Rosa, the way of sorrows it's called now. But it's the street in Jerusalem that's probably the steepest one there. And as he started making his way up there, he was weak, he was beaten, he was deserted, his disciples weren't even in the area, and he fell. It was just too much. The emotional strain, the loss of blood, he fell under his cross. And a man stepped out of the crowd, a man named Simon of Cyrene. And the Bible says, doesn't say what nationality he was, but tradition says that he was a black man. And this man came out and picked the cross up, took it up for Jesus and carried it the west of the way to Golgotha, to Calvary, the place of the skull. And they put that cross down on the ground and they ripped Jesus' robe off his back again and made him bleed again. They threw him down, naked on the cross. They stretched his arms out. They got an eight-inch spike. They took that eight-inch spike and they placed it in the middle of the lower part of his hands where the small bones are. So they took that nail. They put his hand against the wood. They put a foot in his palm, put the nail down in the heel of his hand, and took this big mallet, and they drove that nail through his flesh and bones into that wood. And then they stretched out his other hand and they did the same. And then they did his feet. They took one foot, placed it on top of the other, in step to sole. Then they took a 12-inch spike. They put it in the middle of his top inset, drove it out through both feet and out through his back heel. and nailed him to the cross. And he, they, then they picked up that cross. They picked it up and they dropped it into a hole in the ground. Then they brought wedges out and nailed the wedges in and Jesus hung between heaven and earth. As he hung on his hands in his weakened condition, the pain was such that it ran down his arms into his chest and caused massive diaphragm spasms and pinched off his lungs so that he couldn't breathe. And so the only way that Jesus could get relief from that was to push all of his weight up on the nail in his feet and stand upright and gasp a couple of gasps of air. And it was during those times that he pushed himself upright to gasp for air that he said such things as, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know, it wasn't just for the Roman soldiers he said that. He was looking all the way down through history and he was looking right at you. Right at you, sister, and right at you, brother, and right at you two sisters and you, brother, he was looking at me and every one of us that he was hanging on that cross for because he wasn't just hanging on the cross for the previous sins of the world or even for the sins of the world that he lived in. He was hanging on the cross for, for your sins and my sins too. And finally he pushed himself up for one last time and he said, it is finished. And his head fell forward on his chest and he slumped back down in his arms for the last time. And he died. He'd lived for three hours on the cross that way, if you call that life.